welcome to OPN, and I um, want to welcome all our chatters and viewers and all the channels that may be screen capping us tonight. Thank you very much for uh, including us in your viewing. This is Angry Pacifist and Yuri for a while, live from the steps of the Freedom Cage. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Right. He is on the street, in the cage, and ready to give us the Angry Pacifist story. So um, what we're going to do, uh, because we... We, we planned everything very tightly except the sundown. I didn't consider that. So we'll yeah, go, and if it starts getting too dark and he can't be seen, we're going to switch to a voice interview to finish up. So um, same yeah. things apply. I want to thank my production team for being in the house and getting started. And so with that being said, we're going to launch right into it. So welcome, Angry Pacifist. Thank you for joining us on OPN tonight. Hey friends, good to be here. It's wonderful. How, is the, uh, how does it look? It looks it's pretty good? good. It's a little pixelated. Yeah. We're running off of um, of 4G here, so it's um, yeah. you know a little bit, but it's fine. We can work with it. Everybody can can fill in the blanks, and it's like theater of the mind, right? Yeah. So good to go. <laughs> so why don't you give us a little introduction of who you are, where you are, any contact information you'd like to share? And any other things that you would like to tell us about yourself before we get into the questions? <laughs> We're going to have a lot of comments from the cage, I think, tonight. That's good. Uh, that's right. Uh, Richard Lynch, also known as Angry Pacifist. I'm in the freedom cage tonight. He's also the fun guy. I'm the fun guy. <laughs> Why? Because he's a botanist. That's yeah. right. I'm the botanist. Be nice. <laughs> Be nice. I'm nice. And, uh... We're coming live from the steps of Federal Hall here on uh, Wall Street, which is, as soon as uh, Mark asked me uh, to do this, I thought we couldn't have any other better place than try to do this from. Uh, uh, I do certainly rely on the live streamers to get information when I'm at ho my house, but this is where I, f you know, I feel my best physically, and I'm with my, my friends here, so I thought this would be a great place to do this. Um, and I actually don't have contact information. I'm, you're going to find out that I'm pretty electronically challenged pretty quickly, so I might as well come out with no that. Worries. No I worries. And Jerry will help me out with, uh, <laughs> with the links and info and stuff. like. I didn't have any links to give to uh, Mark, so I'm sorry about that. Oh, no. That's... I do have one. I have one from, uh, from Billy. I just saw him, and, and I'll give you an update when you know we get a chance to do that. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to have been able to talk to Billy. So, um, so give us a quick weather report. You were good. We're good on uh, the weather for now. Yeah, we had sprinkles here, I guess, about an hour ago, and and it's nice now. We're going into uh, sunset, and so the street lights are on. the The colorful lights on the stock exchange are up. Uh, let me quickly show you the stock exchange. Can you see it? Oh, this is outstanding. Yes, we're getting report yeah. from the field. That's see right. see the paddy wagon our, down our, there? Our, yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> I'm live streaming now. Look at me. Yeah, look, you totally are. <laughs> and I just got word from the chat that this is the most viewers we've ever had on an opening. So so you are getting Oh no. You're getting out there, buddy. So yeah, this is yeah. great. No, uh, I'm I'm mostly known for my my sign, and uh, I really really hate uh, interviews. So this is uh, something that I wanted to do for my friends here. But generally, if a reporter comes up to me for an interview, I say I just show him my sign, you know, and that's it. Well, because uh, you know, what do you? Why do you occupy? You know, you hear that question all the time. I hate that question. Why, why do? Why do you occupy? Why do you occupy? What does this occupy about? That's you get asked that a lot. Yeah, yeah. What's also, uh, with uh, with the mask, I get questions about the mask a lot. Okay. Oh, that would be good. Okay. Yep, that's good video. So, I mean, you you actually are in the forefront of a lot of marches and a lot of protests. So, I can see why people would naturally gravitate towards you because. 
you're you're standing there and your presentation is just so it's so emphatic and so stolid you you know what i mean and so it draws people in you're not you're not raging you're just standing there and you're making just a direct blunt statement and you're speaking for so many of us you know because that's what a lot of us are are angry pacifists and thank goodness you're out there spreading the message for us how many people are in and around the cage right now uh let's see we have about ten in the cage and about five or six of us outside the cage. Uh, right. So a little crowdy here right now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, a lot of people sort of escaped over to 60 Wall during the rain, so I expect people will start filtering back now that the steps are dry. And uh, hopefully we'll get some Silent Ninja in tonight. Uh, I can take you to see that once it once, uh, you get started. Yes, well, that'll be great. And, yeah. you know, you have total total portability so you can you can walk around at any time you want so um i was wondering if you could recap what it was that brought you to be part of the occupy movement what was your entry point oh, okay um i had uh, i had been to uh Liberty square a couple of times <laughs> yuri's pretending to murder a occupier right now. <laughs> oh, it's a cage match. <laughs> it's a cage match. So, uh, but uh, ap uh, after uh, October 1st, after the uh, arrest on the Brooklyn Bridge, I, I, I was so angry that I was not arrested that day that I dedicated myself as much as I could be to, uh, to the movement because, um, you know, after 9-11 here in New York City, it was actually really difficult to be a protester. For a lot of events, they set up these cages on the west side near the Hudson River, and they would put hundreds of protesters in cages and just leave us for days at a time. So there was a real effort to try to quell uh, protests. And um, so, you know, I've been arrested since 9-11, but, but Occupy has really made protesting uh, much more accessible to people in New York City now, and, and you know, um, you know, standing up for ourselves. It's been, I think, a lot easier and a lot better since uh, since Occupy. Right. Did you have an activist history before Occupy? Um, uh, somebody tried to call me. That might be one of the problems with doing this on the phone. No, it's it's uh, it's good. It's, yeah, I just try to ignore it. But uh, yeah, I've been uh, I've been a protester since the 1970s. Uh, I like to say that I've been arrested in every decade since the 1970s. Uh, 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 started doing environmental work in the late 1970s uh, here in New York City, and then uh, I uh, lived in Berkeley. I went to Berkeley for college, uh, and. Uh, that was during the anti-apartheid uh, divestment movement uh, in the United States, and uh, that was a really long, drawn-out protest, and it was much more involved and, and much more physical and, you know, potentially violent than uh, things that I've been into lately. But uh, we were able to get the university to take uh, seven, no, four billion dollars it had invested in South Africa. Uh, out of South Africa, and uh, after Nelson Mandela was released, he said that the student movement in the United States really helped to bring down apartheid in South Africa. So, um, you know, when sometimes when you're in the middle of a movement, you you, you don't understand what the outcome is going to be necessarily, or if it's going our way. But almost everything I've been a part of has been really successful over time. So. Um, and then in the 1990s, I became really involved with ACT UP here in New York City um, and lived through sort of the unknown plague that uh, America really hasn't acknowledged that a lot of us live through. Um, you might have to sp up. speak up a little bit because the off-screen people are drowning you out a yeah. smidge. Uh, I bought the headset that's supposed oh, to have man, a... that's great. Whatever you're doing yeah. right now. Yeah, I put the other earbud in. I think it has a microphone, so Excellent. you can hear better. Oh hell yeah, that was okay. great. Okay, <laughs> thank right. you. Yeah, 
Yeah. No, it was worth walking up to to J and R to to get the earbuds. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the 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 90s were were pretty eventful. Um, one of our big actions in the 1990s was uh, we had a mar big mass march in Washington to help um, mourners to distribute their lovers' ashes on the White House lawn, and uh, I was one of the um, the soft block to try to protect these people from the parks police and uh, almost got run over by a, a mounted police officer. So, um, so in, in fact, uh, Occupy has been less eventful than my <laughs> my past operations. Uh, so, well, that that's but now, that's good in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I am really dedicated to to nonviolence. I really feel very strongly about it, and um, you know, maybe not everybody that sees my sign understands it uh, immediately. But I'm hoping that it sort of plants like a little subliminal seed in there, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, so it's and uh, you know, I always walk in the front of marches. People know this about me now, <laughs> but it's mostly to keep an eye on the police. Um, there have been too many kettling incidents in Occupy where people have gotten arrested um, in marches, and I like to try to have my arrests mean something very specifically and not just be, um, you know, due to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. Well, um, can we speak a little bit about the sign? Like, what was the origin? What was the thought? Or was it just a toss-off and then it became a thing? Because it's an iconic symbol of the whole Occupy movement. <laughs> And and I love it because I, I always, as an artist, I say, never doubt you can change the world with a piece of cardboard and a Sharpie. That's right. Well, if anybody was watching uh, the streams the night my sign was taken from me by, by the parks police, uh, I became very attached to my sign. Um, I was in Zuccotti one day, and uh, they had this cardboard coloring area and I was just coloring with kids all afternoon and sort of let my mind sort of wander as we were playing with the crayons and everything and then I thought well you know maybe I should make a sign for myself and um, describe my world view and it sort of came to me pretty quickly so um, that was back in early October I guess so you know, I've been car carrying the sign ever since then and um, it's weird that you become like, you know, it's really the only physical memory of the camp that I have. So, you know, I guess that's why I became so so attached to it. And I'm actually, you know, part of part of my lawsuit against the Park Service is to get my original sign back because it was the only sign they took that they actually put in the van. Um, so it must be somewhere. That's my, that's my hope. But yeah. the fact is, the new sign is actually better. It's, it's a better, it's a better quality sign. So I'm happy with it. Yep. And did you happen to bring the new sign with you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? Hold it up. Let's let's see what's going on with it. Can you see? Uh, it's a little dark. Oh no, we can see it. Man, yeah. nice tight lettering on yes. high grade cardboard. <laughs> you gotta love that. It's doubled out. It's doubled, and yeah, it's a it's a good sign. Excellent. Angry pacifist in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I love and, it. And uh, the only thing that I've added recently, which which you'll see, is um, I've started wearing the um, the Guy Fox mask uh, a lot mm -hmm. uh, because I started seeing pictures in the media, or people I actually don't look at the media, but people would send me things on Facebook and. Uh, pictures that had my face in it, and um, I, I don't know if other people have been through this experience, but I have when I was younger, where um, if you start seeing your image in the media a lot, um, it can play havoc with your, your ego. Like, it's very hard to remain humble when the media keeps, you know, pushing your image forward in the public. Right, because so, then you start, you kind of absorb some of the hype if you're not careful. I mean, it just yeah. it's just as natural if you're exposed to it. So you wear the mask in order and, uh, to provide some distance between the, the image of the angry pacifist and the person. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I've definitely seen some people here that uh, 
they you know they want to be occupy stars and they're in the media a lot and uh, some of them have are having trouble you know processing all of this and remaining humble and for me humility is you know you know I could say humble pacifist you know but <laughs> I'm really angry in my mind though I'm a, I'd like to be be thought of as a humble person um, so the mask helps with that and also I think it creates um, It cre the anonymous mask sort of cre is is obviously also associated with uh, Occupy now. So it's a shorthand for people in the media to say, this is an occupier, um, and I'm taking a picture of an occupier. Right. So they a lot of people take a picture of the mask, but I get them with the sign. So it's sort of a mutualistic thing. They want to take a picture of the mask, but I get my message out there as well. Right. It's actually a pretty smart tactical manipulation of the, the mainstream media because you're, yeah. you're going, okay, you can have one, but you're getting both, you know, so that's, that's pretty right. pretty thoughtful right. and pretty smart. Um, can On you, uh, May Day, I, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead, May Day. I was just going to say May Day. Um, I stopped counting after about 3,000 photographs, so... You know, the, the the little angry pacifist sign gets a lot of photographs. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> stop. He's killing him. <laughs> I don't There's a cage match going on all around me. Yeah, um, if if new people are turn, tuning in to the channel and on the chat, you know, the impression they're getting is going to be a little bit distressing, I think. <laughs> But, but that's <laughs> Occupy, it's street theater at times, right. and that's what we got, right? Um, right. I was right. wondering if you could describe your current participation in Occupy, kind of maybe what your what your Occupy days are like, so to speak, to kind of give people a sense of what it's like to be an underground protester that has a you know, fairly high frequency of attendance. Yeah. Um, well, most recently, uh, I was at uh, Union Square three weeks ago. Uh, three weeks ago today? Uh, and with my friend Billy, and he got a tweet from Joe, and Joe said, um, I'm going to go sleep out on Wall Street tonight. Anybody want to go? And uh, so that was sort of a, sort of a turning point uh, for me. So about, I guess about 25 of us came down here that first night and, and slept right here on Wall Street. Um, I don't know if, I think most people know, no, maybe not everybody knows that uh, I have chronic Lyme disease, so I suffer with uh, this illness that looks a lot like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So I'm always in a lot of pain and I'm always very, very tired. So um, what I ended up doing was staying out every other night uh, and then and sort of collapsing and, and resting in the in between days. Um, so uh, I'm not I'm not able to do as much as I want to do, but I do as much as I can do. Um, and I, I struggle with a little bit of guilt about um, leaving leaving my leaving my friends behind a little bit. Um, but uh, you know they know that I'm doing the best that I can. So. Right. And it's a it's a great effort you put in, and I think it's an important point to make that um, you know we all can only do what we can do, and we're we're right. not in this you know in this to be judgmental or competitive. Everybody can bring something to the table, and we can do it in a million different ways. So you know, bless you for being out there, and all the efforts everybody else does. I believe they're all equally valid and they're all equally necessary because it, it takes all those different efforts combined together to service. So, it you know, in talking with you earlier, like when we were doing the warm-up and the conversations before, you had explained that to me. And I have a great deal of respect for you, you know, because you're, you're, you're calculating your days, you're pacing yourself, you're contributing all that you can contribute, and you are doing it in a manner that is fairly sustainable for you. So that's you know, really impressive and something I have a lot of respect for you about. Um, 
Well, you know, also I had this, uh, I had this spinal surgery, I guess almost two months ago. Right, it's been fairly okay. recent. So, I was, yeah, I was, I was out of commission uh, for about three weeks, and I would watch uh, OPN and Occupy Earth and Occupied Air and uh, Elizabeth's channel, and literally cry in front of my computer almost every day that. I wasn't with my friends. Once you become an occupier, it's it's almost gut wrenching not to be um, with your friends. And so the live stream is it's a little bit of a du double edged sword. Is it, it provides this awesome information uh, about what's going on in the streets, but it also it it calls out to you to come. And when you can't come, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a painful experience. Right. Well, I I know even on this side of the equation, you know, out in the ether, we all feel pretty much the same way. You know, we want to contribute, we want to do more, and maybe it's a good time yeah. to speak speak to that a little bit about the um, the gap between the um, people on the ground and the broader you know people and supporters out there in the ether how do you view that do you guys feel supported um are you recognizing you have the support do you feel like there's a better way we could build bridges between the two so that we can we can help you guys better uh kind of what do you feel about that and maybe some observations you have from people on the ground with you well uh you know ever since uh thorin has been streaming out here uh and we probably have five or six regular people that also do streaming for Occupied Air. Um, they love you guys. Like, they really love talking to chat. Like, I, you know, we have all of our friends here, but it really opens up this wider community to occupiers on the ground. And that, I didn't expect that, uh, but it's, it's a really beautiful thing that, that's happening here. Um, and of course, uh, you know, all the food donations here have just been a godsend because, you know, I can, I can go almost anywhere in New York City and buy food for myself or some of my friends, but it's, you know, most of the people here don't have that option. So, that, you know, that's been a, that's been a great thing. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is, is once you start donating food, it's like, you know, you put the bird feeder out <laughs> and then... You have, to, you have to keep filling the bird feeder, uh, so there but maybe there becomes an expectation, um, and that's you know obviously that's a problem uh, because I know I certainly know some of the people that have been have been gracious enough to to send pizzas, and I know a lot of people have spent you know all the money they have you know trying to help on the ground here, and I would always I would always you know say. You know, do what you can, but don't, you know, don't impoverish yourself, you know, in order to help people here. You have to, you know, strike a balance. Um, certainly, I try to stretch my uh, Social Security disability check uh, as far as it can go here at Occupy and, you know, food stamps and all the other things. So, but um, I know some people have gone way beyond what they should be doing. And, you know, it's appreciated, but... People ought to, you know, yeah, I thought, spread, the, spread that out. Yeah. Right. That's a good good point because if we don't um, pace ourselves and spread it out, then you become overextended and then it becomes another issue to deal with. And I, I like to think that, you know, it's it's good to take care of yourselves so you can take care of other people, right? You, you, can't, you can't be 100% self-sacrificing or it just breaks down you know, any number of ways. So that's a good point to make. Um, you mentioned I, Billy. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned yeah. Billy, who is a good friend of ours. Now we interviewed him, and I know you have a sign, and I want to get it up while it's still light enough yeah. for people to see it. I, did, I didn't make the sign because uh, I was just over, uh, I met up with Billy at uh, Liberty. He was, he was, it was pretty horrible. He was crying really, really badly, and, um, I thought he was crying about, you know, uh, the issue, you know, the health issues he's dealing with, and and. Whoopsie. 
we'll get it back. There's a little connection problem. Everybody just hold tight. Whoops. I think moving the sign something might have went awry. So um, give me just a moment. Ah, there we go. We're getting close, people. Be of good cheer and good faith. Hello? Yeah, you're there, so you're there. Just turn your camera on. Uh, okay, front I, camera. I figured you bumped something with the sign. <laughs> Did I? Oh, oh I don't know. You know. Sorry, no, no, it's fine. Yeah. We, we had a plan. This is the first time I've done this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, uh, Billy is one of the few people that saw a lot of the bad things that happened uh, during the raid on November 15th, and uh, he's one of the only people that has agreed to testify in this $100 million lawsuit against the city for uh, destroying all of our possessions that night. Um, so he's really upset about that, um, and... Uh, you know, I was just trying to console him and try to remind him that he has to, uh, you know, he has to deal with his health issues as well. So, uh, actually, after I leave you, uh, he, they went up to a bar, so I'm going to go meet up with him and see what's going on. Um, but I, I, so I didn't get a chance to make the sign, but uh, if you have the link for it, uh, it's very long link. Yep. Uh, we should have the WePay link for that, yeah. It's uh, wepay.com slash donations slash California dash living dash expenses health, one word, dash expenses. Okay, we got it. You have it? We got it up. And as a reminder to all our friends watching, yeah, Suze was way ahead of us. <laughs> Suze, oh, yeah. Suze, yeah, Suze, yeah, Suze, Suze is like, just move on with it. I got it. No big deal. Um, so as a reminder to all our friends watching and maybe the new people, this is for our friend Billy Livesley, who is headed out to California. He recently was diagnosed with uh, leukemia and has to go out for treatment and all that and so we're trying to help raise fund for him to go out there and get his feet on the ground it's a tragic tragic story with his diagnosis but he is such a fantastic human being and I want to point everybody to the OPN archive um, the interview with him is on there it's an hour and a half long you should sit there and watch it straight through it is one of the most phenomenal expressions from a human being that I've ever seen. He's been a long time activist and organizer and an occupier from day one. So so thank you and I understand you two are really good friends and you know you're kind of bearing that weight too that having found out this news so you know, our sympathies with everybody yeah. and in that. Um, but thank you for, for bringing that up and yeah I feel confident that people are going to rally around because part of what we're trying to do is you know, help each other out. We can't depend on institutions. We can't depend on organizations. We have each other, and that's absolutely our yeah. best route to take. Um, so that was yeah. It just was shock, shock to see uh, Billy, you know, crying when I walked up to him and assumed that it was about a health issue. But knowing Billy now, as I do, it was about activism. You know, it was about uh, his desire to 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 
you know, speak truth to power, which is what this lawsuit is doing. And, you know, if he ends up being the only one that, w that can testify to, in particular, the destruction of the library, like thousands of books were destroyed um, as they were being loaded onto the, to the garbage trucks uh, that morning. And um, so we're back in business. Can everybody see right. and hear? And we got Richard and his neck brace with that intense look on his face. He's making a statement. So thank you for battling through that, Richard. We'll just go on through. Um, I guess, you know, you gave us a lead up of your activism in the 70s and all that. And we had a little side conversation and you told me that you're interested in biology and botany and plants and things like that. You want to talk a little bit about that and how that relates kind of to your activism overall? Yeah, um, you're coming in on my end a little choppy, but I think the question was about uh, my uh, my botany and my environmental work. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually started uh, the first ecology club in high school in New York City back in 1974, 75. And um, there, where I lived out on Staten Island, there was a huge amount of... of residential development going on, wetlands being filled, and uh, uh, forests being destroyed. So uh, it was very hard for me to see that and, and not want to do something about that. So um, starting ever since I was 14, I've been doing environmental conservation work and um, just decided that I wanted to make that a career. Um, so uh, I... Uh, decided that botany was the best choice for me because uh, doing land planning uh, with uh, wetland designations and endangered native plants, it, I could, as a professional, I could make a really good case for protection of some of these areas based on the plant life or the wetlands. So, uh, and also, you know, I've just always been uh, interested in, in native plants. So, um, so that's uh, been my, my official career ever since then. Uh, since the 1970s, uh, the environmental community has been able to add about 8,000 acres of uh, natural lands as natural park lands in New York City, yeah. which is you know roughly the size of Manhattan. So it's a, it's a pretty large amount of space that we've been able to save. Um, but some of the losses have just been you know, really, really horrific. And uh, uh, the, one of the latest battles was that the International Speedway Corporation wanted to bring a, a NASCAR stadium to Staten Island, and that would have required the filling of almost 700 acres of uh, wetlands and, and natural areas. And that that's about nearly the size of Central Park. So it's a, it a huge development. Um, so that's mostly what I put my... My good work, too, is studying uh, native plants, and I work a lot with uh, endangered native plants and uh, endangered species. Um, I actually have discovered several new uh, plant species that I'm in the process of describing um, and also getting those protected as uh, endangered species. So that's sort of my environmental work in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I love that, you know, even in your professional life, that's a fairly activist-oriented type of thing you're you're doing so it kind of indicates that the the interest of the whole person is in activism yeah. in every way you know we we try to talk yeah. about social and economic and environmental activism and you you bring it all together in quite quite a nice model there it's highly commendable um what is the biggest lesson you've learned as part of occupy Lessons learned from Occupy. The largest, the biggest lesson. Largest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, it's been really uh, an education for me to, you know, go from having most of my friends and family being, you know, rather middle class people. Uh, you know, I own a home and I have a car and 
uh, my consulting work, I have a job, but now, you know, most of my really close friends don't, you know, they don't have a place to sleep at night. They don't have a home. And uh, so I've had to, you know, I've had to come to grips with what that means in my life, that, that these people that I really do love, you know, in a way that I just don't love other people. Like, this is my you know, new adopted family here. So, you know, I have a little bit of guilt about that. And, uh, you know, I've had to work through that. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's been a, it's been a, a real education for me to understand that really, really good people can through no fault of their own, find them in difficult, find themselves in difficult situations. Right. And, uh, yeah, and I'm, uh, you know, and I'm proud of them for being occupiers, you know, in spite of all the other hardships. And, right. and I think part of the conversation we ha- we've had and I've had out here and people who know, uh, I, I recently had a really tremendous fight with someone in chat because I felt that sometimes people don't realize the hardships that people are living through out here and have higher expectations of the occupiers out here than, than they should. Um, you know, if people are sleeping under a bridge all night um, and then when 60 Wall Street opens, if they can get a couple of hours of sleep at 60 Wall, people shouldn't complain that they're not in the freedom cage. Um, or when it's raining, that they should they should stay in the freedom cage. Um, everybody's doing their best out here, and uh, you know I feel like you know this struggle is real, and uh, it includes people that are are really struggling. So um, maybe I, I stand up for them too much in chat. Uh, maybe I can take a little bit of a step back position. Uh, I don't know because you have a unique position. I mean, you're you're you have the experience and capability to see this from all the angles, which is um, a unique perspective. Because um, one of my arguments about chats has always been that it's kind of one dimensional, and I guess if you're if you're on the ground and not participating in the chats in a way that can be one dimensional too, and we never know what the whole story is with anybody. And so we have to allow that that possibility to exist, and try to find the bridges um, to, to to come across that and connect instead of divide. I think. Right. Yeah. No. This is um, it's a new experience for me, and I'm sure you know people, you know, watching it on live stream or you stream. So, you know, I I think maybe I need to, you know. The people here don't really, you know, they don't really overreact to what anybody says in chat. So I think that's a lesson that I can take from it. <laughs> you know, take it with a grain of, take anything on chat with a grain of salt. They think maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, you 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 come across as a very, you know, fairly conscious and gracious person by demeanor. Would you say being part of Occupy has, um expanded your capacity for gratitude because I think that's an interesting point you make you know that that you you have a home and you have a car and now you're with people who have next to nothing or nothing and that yeah. you've bonded with them and that you're kind of struggling with what all that means has it in, increase your capacity for gratitude and compassion um I think that I think that I've always really strived to be as compassionate as possible. I, I you know I, I grew up in the projects here in New York City on welfare, and I was physically and emotionally abused as a kid. So when I was really young, I had to sort of come to grips with the, the realities of the world. So you know I was reading Plato um, at thirteen. Uh, very dedicated to under, trying to philosophically understand why the world works the way it does. So, I, you know, I've been a fan of most of the great pacifists for a long time, and um, I think maybe this has it's provided more like real world examples of how to use my compassion. And um, you know, the angry pacifist is 
even though it has the word angry in it, and everyone here calls me angry, <laughs> I'm still, I think the, I'm more of a pacifist than I'm angry. So uh, compassion is uh, a real core uh, principle with me. And uh, that's what I mean about chat, is I just have to have more compassion for where, where anyone is coming from. It's a little harder because you're limited to the number of characters in Ustream to be able to say something. And I'm always trying to invite people down here that, if, you know, we have a, we could have a much longer argument. Uh, and, uh, and I certainly do get into arguments uh, <laughs> at Occupy. But I like to think that at the end of every argument, even if we disagree, that, that I'm willing to sort of hug it out and, uh, you know, try to remain as best friends as we can be. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it's tested my compassion, and by testing my compassion, it's it's reinforced uh, the things that that, are, that I have as core beliefs. Right. Um. Am Am I mistaken, or did you work in de-escalation, you know, months ago, like uh, post Zuccotti, or did I just dream that? I. I it was a little. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's the new headset I got, but it's not. Uh, maybe I could do this. Can I do this without the headset? Maybe? Well, yeah, yeah. I I suspect it's our Google connection and your low battery. So, um, yeah. you can try that. Let me try that. See okay. if that helps. Rut roll. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you fine. Am I still breaking up? Can you hear me, uh, Mark? Yes. Yes. No, not too well though, right? Yeah, it's 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 workable. Is it okay? Because I can hear you a lot better now. Okay, we'll go with this then. This is oh, fine. Oh, it's also the phone. <laughs> so, yeah, you would think that the latest 4G phone would work in New York City. Well, it's just the battery, you know. But um, so role model, you you spoke about you had studied historical pacifists. Give me a role model. Uh, uh, for for a short time when I was uh, my late teens, I was able to live at an environmental center in uh, the Green Belt in Staten Island uh, when I was being trained as a, a naturalist educator, um, and uh, I became uh, you know just a fool for Hen Henry David Thoreau, and uh, actually a little bit later um, I became a, I'm a total fan and acolyte of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So, um, I, you know, if I had one link, and I don't have any links, but if, if, I, if I were to ask people to Google one thing, it would be um, Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience. Um, because, you know, you know, the reason I get arrested is to express my compassion in the world. It's a uh, you know, that's why some people complain that I say I have fun when I get arrested. I don't mean fun, but I mean that, you know, I'm standing up for the core principles, you know, that I feel in my heart. And um, so for me, compassion and uh, civil disobedience are really, really closely related to each other. Um, and, you know, Emerson, of course, expanded these ideas about compassion in, in so many of his essays as well. Um, Thoreau tended to be a little bit more uh, pragmatic, you know, counting how many bushels of beans he could grow on a quarter acre plot at uh, Walden Pond and, and these sorts of things. So I think Emerson is probably more of a hero of mine as an adult, and, and Thoreau was more a hero of mine as a, as a young person. But that particular essay on civil disobedience, it just... Um, it's so profound that uh, you know the circumstances under which he was he was taken in was not paying his real estate taxes, and he only spent one night in jail, and some friend of his paid his taxes. And so it wasn't a big issue really in his life, but he thought a lot about it, and you know he's certainly one of the first people that um, that published on the idea of of civil disobedience as an expression of of your court principles. So. Um, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of his. Of course, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was, you know, just an amazing part of, of my young life. And then uh, after he was assassinated, and, you know, I was growing up uh, in the 70s, um, 
when I got out to Berkeley, um, once the once the movement got started in a big way, which was after uh, a group of about a hundred of us were living on the steps of the administration building for a month, and they eventually sent in the National Guard in the middle of night, and they beat us up and took us out to Santa Rita State Prison for a week. Uh, when we came back, there were 50,000 people in, in, in Sproul Plaza, and it became, you know, a really big protest movement. So I was able to meet people like Coretta Scott King. Um, I was arrested with Angela Davis, and, um, you know, I still have the pick that Richie Havens played with the day that he came to visit us. <laughs> so I actually got to meet a lot of my, my heroes uh, at during that time. And then uh, through Occupy, I got to meet and talk to Harry Belafonte, who is amazing, amazing, nonviolent, you know, civil rights activist, um, and who was also, you know, very good friends with, with Martin and, and a lot of people in that movement. So and one thing I said to him that I, I think kind of resonates is, you know, sitting here in the literally in the shadow of this giant George Washington statue. Um, I don't, you know, I, I feel like the people that we call founding fathers are not my founding fathers. Um, I think anybody who owned other people and made them do the work while they, you know, you know, went off and did other things, I don't have a lot of, you know, it, it's hard to honor some people that did talk dishonorable things. So telling Harry Belafonte that he was, one of, he's one of my founding fathers, you know, the ones that I would choose as founding fathers was really rewarding part of my experience with Occupy. And, um, and all, a lot of these older activists that com constantly come and give us their blessings and, you know, they understand how the struggle is difficult and, um, you know, so I've met, I've met a lot of people through Occupy that I really admire as well. It's wonderful, and, and I, I have to say, this is exactly why we do OPN, to hear these yeah. stories from from people like yourselves, you know, that have historical context and observations, yeah. and that you, you you make this so real for us, and, and that was a wonderful uh, relating of your experiences, I I just pulled that question out of thin air, and I'm just glad I did. I just feel I feel I don't know fulfilled by hearing it, you know, and optimistic. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to regather my thoughts here because I'm like, well, it just doesn't get better than that. <laughs> that was <laughs> wonderful. Um, yeah. So maybe now's a good time to ask the question about what do you think the biggest challenge we face as a movement is? The biggest challenge? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess that depends upon, you know, which Occupy. Um, I've, you know, I've tried to make a really clear distinction between who I am as an Occupier and the rest of the movement and not really um, spend any time on complaining about anyone else or anything that I can't change. So, you know, I, I kind of do my thing in Occupy um, and representing here and, you know, being your correspondent tonight from the Freedom Cage is an awesome thing for me and, and being out here with my friends. So, I, but I do think that um, Occupy Wall Street is, is clearly, uh, with the success of May Day, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, uh, other occupies that maybe are more uh, physically active or confrontational with uh, the police. I don't see that necessarily as being productive for the movement. Um, you know, personally, I ident identify the police as part of the 99%. So, I, you know, I don't see them as adversaries. Um, I see them as tools by people like Michael Bloomberg, but I don't see them as adversaries. So. Um, I think that you can you can separate uh, uh, Occupy into you know specific targets that we're working on, and also this culture raising or cultural awareness raising movement. And I think both of those are moving ahead pretty well. Uh, we have really awesome people like Alexis Goldstein, uh, who is working with Occupy the SEC, 
and um, your viewers can see her. She was on Chris Hayes' show uh, this past Saturday morning. She's a really bright person. She really knows uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, and uh, she she worked on Wall Street. She's she's really representing for us as to what what needs needs to happen. Did I lose you? No, you. But you're going to just keep talking until we we crash. <laughs> just yeah. So that's oh, that's my yeah, that's telling me I have limited lifespan here. Right. Um, so I, I think that there are people that are working on very specific targets um, for us, and I want to support those people. Um, so when they do actions that are directed at occupying the SEC, um, you know, really for that, um, you know. Uh, my opportunity of Mike checking Newt Gingrich at a Tea Party conference uh, by myself, which was the scariest thing I've done in my life. Um, you were a solo guy. mic checker? <laughs> uh, once you lose your fear of them, almost anything is possible. So, But I also think there is this larger cultural movement that is going on with Occupy. And it's harder to say what the, what the goal is. It's like saying... You know, aside from ending the Vietnam War, what was the goal of, you know, the 60s? Um, I think, for me, it's seeing uh, young women here at Occupy, you know, taking control of their lives and, you know, being really strong, assertive women. Uh, I think that's such a beautiful thing to see. Um, very, in, in, you know, uh, empowering um, for all of us to see each other supporting each other. So... Um, I don't actually look at a lot of mainstream media, uh, so I don't know if the larger society, you know, is seeing all of this. But um, I think May Day was just such a, an example of, you know, twenty to thirty thousand people uh, coming together in love and protesting in love. So, um, you know, and you know, unfortunately, we have this, this specter of. Uh, Syria and Iran, uh, you know, in the forefront now, uh, in a way that is very similar, in, at least the way I see it, to the you know the run up to the Iraq War, and um, I'm also I also work with Peace Action here in New York State, and uh, so I do a lot of Peace Action protests. And before the Iraq War, we had almost a million people in the streets of New York City protesting against wars. So I think there's sort of a natural symbiosis between what Occupy is doing and what anti-war people are doing. And I have hopes that by summer we might be seeing some really large um, street protests, not you know in the tens of thousands, but in the hundreds of thousands. So that's my hope, at least, that, that Occupy grows into you know a real cultural movement as well as the specific things we want to work on. I, too, would love to see that, and that's one of my, my things. You know, I spend a lot of time looking at Spain and Greece uh, specifically, and even in Egypt, you know, they roll out 100,000, 200,000 people daily. And I yeah. think that's how we can gain momentum really quick. I'm really interested, from my perspective, in making that mm -hmm. as peaceful as possible. Um, but I think large numbers of peaceful people that refuse to tolerate the status quo is an extremely powerful statement. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm hoping mean, that same thing. Peaceful arrests, too. You know, I have all my fantasies of, you know, um, you know, these marches marching up to some, you know, huge line of mounted officers and SWAT in riot gear, and then we just literally walk 10 feet up to them and then just sit down in mass and, you know, send a a six-year-old child with a flower up to one of the officers. <laughs> like, I, I, I think that, you know, civil disobedience is a tool. And um, one of the things that Occupy hasn't done very well is make people feel comfortable getting arrested um, because we, you know, we go on these death marches and people get kettled and people who didn't want to get arrested get arrested. So we're getting a lot better at it now. And with the spring trainings and uh, May Day, our tactics, you know, have, have changed quite a bit. So, you know, nonviolence uh, and peace, but also, you know, literally putting your body in the way of the war machine or the, the machine, you know, the corporate machinery that's trying to destroy us. So 
those two things are interconnected in my mind at least. Yeah, I have much the same vision of you about walking up to the horse line, but I always want the kids to take apples for the horses. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Too. But, um, so just touching on a previous statement, um, and there's a lot of discussion about this now going on in you know, the Twitter sphere and the chatter sphere and all that. Revolution versus reform. How do you see bridging that gap? Say that again? Revolution versus reform. The Occupy movement seems to be breaking along two lines. Um, yeah. And so there is a gap of the revolutionaries, which, you know, perceive total overthrow as being a solution versus the reformist. And yeah. that gap is getting, it seems to me, is getting wider. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on bridging it. Yeah, I mean, we have this conversation on a daily basis here about, you know, what is the definition of anarchy? And what is an anarchist? And uh, some of my friends are clearly revolutionaries, um, and they don't think it's important to renounce violence specifically as a tool in revolution. But there are also, you know, nonviolent anarchists. So even within the anarchist movement, there are people that embrace pacifism. Uh, they're not, you know, maybe they're not the majority, but. Um, but what, like, what we see in Oakland with the, the fuck the police and the black bloc and these sorts of things, I, it's a little derogatory, but I just call them the revolutionary children, um, because, um, I don't think that, you know, they've really thought through the idea that America will become a governless, governless society, governmentless society, and that we'll all you know, share equally without any government regulations or any corporations. And so I think ultimately the people that are working behind the scenes in, in these sort of working groups that I talked about, like Occupy the SEC um, or Occupy the Bank, these sorts of things, that they, they're reformists and you know, they know how, you know what they need to get done to to make our government work better. Um, you know, anybody who knows me up until very recently, I, I was, you know, great supporter of our president, and uh, I would say things like, you know, when he told us to put on our take off our slippers and put on our marching boots, that you know I am out here in the streets marching for him to, you know, feel that there's real support for him to to be a, ref a good reformer in government, but, you know, then I got arrested federally on the steps of Federal Hall, and uh, one of the reasons I did that was just to test, you know, the administration's view on Occupy, because it doesn't matter how many times he says at rallies that he's a supporter of Occupy and uses the 99% rhetoric in speeches, if he's going to have us arrested on the steps of Federal Hall, I mean, you know, so I, I say now that that night uh, he lost my vote. But, you know, New York State is so blue, it doesn't really matter who you vote for. <laughs> so I'm not in a battleground state, um, so I'll probably go. I'm actually a registered Green Party member, um, so that's probably how I'll vote this time. So, yeah, I think that we need to, you know, we need to keep having that discussion, but just continue to have as much room for everyone to express themselves the way that they feel best expressing themselves. So um, I'm just glad to be living in New York City. Um, I think Occupy Wall Street is very, very close to where I would choose to be in, in, in a movement. I think if I lived in Oakland, I would have a harder time integrating myself into you know, the marches. And marches, I, I call myself a marcher. That's what I do best. Uh, you know, I love being out front and taking the streets and closing traffic and all that All that stuff is, is you know, the key to, to understanding me and the movement is being physically in the movement. Um, it would be hard for me to do that in Oakland, I think, with uh, 
with a lot of the tactics that are used uh, in the marches. Right. Um, so it, I think it's maybe locality dependent a little bit. Uh, you know where you are and what the tactics are in your in your own occupy. Um, and I say this all the time here is I just have such you know I'm in such awe of the occupies in smaller cities um, when I see um, um, you know streamers from there telling their stories because you know in New York City you can get uh, 20,000 people out on a May Day uh, and uh, even in the middle of winter in the worst times uh, you know sleeting rain showers we could get four or five hundred people out for a march but I think in really smaller cities it takes a really special kind of person to keep press persevering when, you know, you maybe only have 20 to 40 to 50 people on a regular basis that, that are participating. I think then that's when the interpersonal stuff becomes, you know, more, you know, more of a potential drag on the movement. Here, you know, there's just so many people that you can find, you know, you can find your group no matter, you know, who you are at Occupy New York, uh, Wall Street. Yeah, um, actually, one of my favorite small occupies is Occupy Nashville, and we were had the fortune last night to have uh, Krishna Love, who is one of the two streamers for ON on there, and she joined our panel, and it was so awesome to have her there, and she's in the chat tonight, and I just want to give her props because they said their Occupy is down to like 10 or 12 people, and they're just embattled and discouraged, but they're going to keep on keeping on. So it's right. wonderful to hear you say that and to yeah. let everybody know that we support all occupies, large and small, and they're all equally important. So, Chris, you keep up the good fight and pass that on to the Nashville people. Um, I just had to throw that out there. Um, so I think we're kind of getting close to being wound up if, the chatters want to ask questions, you know the deal, put it in bold, and I'll read them off. And for um, the rest of us, let's say, what's your next step in Occupy in the near future, Angry? Because tell us kind of what you see on the horizon. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I got a lot of breakage in that. Oh. Could you repeat that? Yeah, I asked what your next step in Occupy is? What is on your horizon? Oh, I'm still recovering from May Day, so... <laughs> yeah, we're all recovering from May Day over here. Um, well, actually, we start um, summer civil disobedience training uh, right away uh, on Wednesdays here, and um, I think we're going to move uh, civil disobedience around the city, and uh, like I said, uh, Organizing our marching tactics better and pre-planning our civil disobedience so that you know not the same you know not the same dozen people keep getting arrested over and over and over again, which is it's really taxing on people. I've only been arrested twice so far, but I'm just surprised I didn't I didn't get arrested on May Day. Um, and you know, friends of ours have been arrested up to eight times now, so it's really it really wears on them. So uh, that's the next. Um, the next big thing for, for the street, um, and, you know, like I said, there are so many people that are doing um, other good work that we don't necessarily see on the street, but I've always identified myself as a, as a street-level protester. I feel like that's where I do, I do my best work um, uh, as, a, as a protester, and uh, so I'll, still be, I'll be out here. I mean, I want to do something beyond the freedom cage. Uh, it's getting a little boring, um, but this is literally the only square footage that we, you know, we can assemble and tell our stories directly to um, the people on Wall Street. You know, it's sort of amazing that we, you know, we spend all this time right on Wall Street, and um, you know, they haven't they haven't figured out a way to drive us out completely. Although they're you know they're making it very difficult for us. So so we'll see. Um, you know. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, as heat tolerant as some other people. So, if it's 108 degrees out here, you know, in July, you won't, you won't see me. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we want you no, to take well, care of yourself and pace yourself so you're here for the long haul. So, you know, yeah, you have right. our support on that. Um, before yeah. your your battery dies completely, I I want to express my gratitude and how honored I am that you spent the evening with us and how humbled I am by your story and your efforts. And thank you so much for being on yeah, the ground there and so that. much for talking to us. Uh, the chatters are all highly enthusiastic. You're getting a lot of positive commentary and uh, appreciation and love. So I wanted you to know that because there are a few questions that I want to ask, but it's important to me to for you to know how grateful we are that you're on the ground for us and that you're taking time out to talk to us. I appreciate yeah, well, that. I'm sure everyone on chat, if they don't know how much I love them, uh, saying it right now, I love all of you. Um, I think that's more than compassion. I think I found more love in my heart. I just, you know, I just I love everybody at Occupy. There are very few people that I sort of can't stand. <laughs> there are a couple, you know, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Where are you going to Staten Island? Uh, I'm almost finished. Don't leave me. Yeah, don't leave you. <laughs> Tell him don't leave me, man. Yuri wants Yuri wants to meet my doggies. Well, that he can meet them in a few minutes. We're gonna ask a couple questions that will let you go. How about that? <laughs> um, Uppity has has three three questions a series that I think are are really valuable. So I'm gonna read them off really quick. You know what I'm going to do is because it, it's, it's so hard hearing you uh -huh. that uh, I'm going to I'm going to head home, but I'll be at my computer in 45 minutes. Okay. So if people, you know, we can I can get back on chat. Is that a possibility? Um. Yeah. So chatter said you hear that his battery's going bad, so his reception's yeah. awful. And the, yeah, it's very choppy. I, I have a hard time hearing you. Right. So we're going to let you go now, and you will be back on the chat in about 45 minutes to answer questions. Right? Yes. Yeah, that would okay. be awesome. Okay. We'll we'll call that we'll call it a wrap on that then. Um. Thank you very very much. Have a safe trip home, and we'll talk to you in a little bit. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. It's All nice right. talking to you. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.